Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we're discussing Haiti with human rights lawyer and activist Brian Concanon. He is executive director of Project Blueprint, which promotes a progressive human rights-based U.S. foreign policy. Wouldn't that be nice? By bringing the perspectives of people impacted by U.S. actions abroad into policy discussions. Brian founded the Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti, IJDH, and was its executive director from 2004 to 2019. And he lived in Haiti from 1995 to 2004, where he served as a human rights officer with the United Nations and co-managing attorney with the Bureau des Avocats Internationaux in my bad French, a public interest law firm. Brian Concanon, welcome to Talk World Radio. Well, thanks for having me, David. It's good to be with you. Uh, Thanks for coming on. Thanks for doing the work you're doing. Uh, You wrote an op-ed back in March suggesting that the U.S. government should maybe stop propping up a quasi-dictatorial ruler. Uh, What do you think now? Uh, You know, unfortunately, what... I predicted in that op-ed has come true. The U.S. continued to prop up the quasi-dictatorial ruler who became less quasi. Uh, the, the government was involved in, according to report by, by Harvard Law School and Haitian Human Rights Groups, was involved in crimes against humanity through a series of, um, of government-supported gang attacks against uh, poor neighborhoods. The corruption in the country increased the attacks on the judiciary increased, the ability to provide basic government services decreased. Um, and so Haiti really uh, has spiraled down since then with the assassination of the president, just the latest uh, symptom of that much bigger problem. This assassination, I, I don't know if you know all the details. It doesn't seem like anyone in the media does, but the, the latest I've been hearing is, uh, you know, veterans, troops, fighters from Colombia, U.S. trained and armed, no doubt, uh, going in pretending to be U.S. drug warriors uh, in order to kill a U.S. puppet ruler. And the solution to all of this is more U.S. troops and weapons. Uh, I can't help but thinking if you just removed the U.S. from each bit of this equation, things would be better, not worse. Well, I think Haitians would say if you had back a year ago, if the U.S. had stopped propping up this dictatorial regime, Haiti would be better off. And even President Moise would be better off. He might be facing trial somewhere, but he'd be, you know, he'd be alive facing the trial. Um, The it's still pretty unclear as to who actually killed uh, President Moise. There are competing theories. Some people are saying, as you mentioned, it was, I mean, there were Colombians there. That, that's fairly well settled. Uh, they, they were former soldiers. Some of them were trained by the United States. Uh, and they were in Haiti, and they were at the president's house. Some people are saying they, they uh were they killed him. Some people say others, perhaps even presidential security, did the killing and that the Colombians are being framed. Um, it's hard to say which is the which is right or if there's another explanation. There's been a lot of very well done misinformation going out. Uh, so it's, you know, so I'm not, I don't think there's any information that would point me to towards a conclusion one way or the other. But to your bigger question, there's lots of uh, good information to point in the direction that that the solution to this problem is not sending in more soldiers by the U.S. or by anybody else. Um, you know, again, Haitians, if you ask Haitians and they keep, you know, I've been on a bunch of calls and every time we say, well, what do you want us to advocate in the U.S.? And they're getting pretty exasperated from us asking that question because they say, look, we've been answering this question the same way for two years, which is stop propping up our dictatorial government. No troops. We don't want troops. And we want we don't want the U.S. and the U.N. to continue to cram down these elections down our throats, because what the every time there's been a critique of of U.S. support for uh, Haiti's Haiti's dictatorial government, the U.S. says, well, we need elections. That's the solution. But it's the solution that the U.S. wants are elections run by 
uh, a dictatorial government. And Haitians know, and anybody with any common sense would know, that's not a solution. That's just going to make things worse. Uh, and what Haitians say is, we want, we think that we have the balance of power within Haiti to force the government to uh, to negotiate and have a broad-based consensus government that can run elections. The only thing that's preventing the, the, the current government from negotiating in good faith with the Haitian people is that it's propped up by the international community. So Haitians say, take out that prop and a Haitian-led solution will come. Um, more troops is just more of a prop. I mean, the troops will be in there to support the dictatorial government, and that's obviously not a solution. And if you look at the most recent uh, U UN military intervention in Haiti, uh, there was a peacekeeping force there from 2004 to 2017, and over 13 years they spent $7 billion, and they left Haiti with more guns and less democracy than it had before. Obviously, Haitians looking at those lessons are saying, well, we don't need more of the same. So the, so over the decades, the, the role of the United Nations has not been much better than the role of the United States, would you say? I think so. So as you mentioned, I, I first got to Haiti with the UN because I believed in that the UN could play an important role in helping build Haitian democracy. And when I was there in, in the 90s, the UN was trying to do that. I mean, there were critiques of the mission I was with, the human rights part, there were critiques of the military part, and a lot of those critiques were founded. But the, the UN more or less was trying to help support democracy in Haiti. Following the coup d'etat in 2004, the, the UN had a very different mission. Its mission was to support the coup d'etat, to consolidate it, because it did not want um, it did not want progressive political forces to take control in Haiti, and especially the, the Lavalas party, which had been which had uh, was the party that was ousted by the 2004 coup d'etat. And the only way, I mean, the UN mission obviously they didn't say they were there to consolidate a coup d'etat. They said they were there for promoting democracy. But if you look at what the uh, UN mission did on the 13 years, it doesn't, their, act, their actions are not consistent with a policy to promote democracy. The only real justification that fits what the UN did is this policy of keeping progressive forces out of Haitian politics. And is, I mean, that the US government, as far as I can tell, has been uh, detrimental to the Haitians since the day it got free from France, right? I mean, is this, is this part of the same policy of centuries now, or what is, what is driving US behavior? Yeah, you ask any Haitian about, you know, what's happening today or what happened last week or last month, their explanation is going to start with 1803, when, when Haiti was the second independent nation in the hemisphere. You would think the first independent nation might welcome some company, but no, what, what the U.S. did was slap an embargo on Haiti. We refused to even recognize the second independent nation in the hemisphere um, until just after we had our own Emancipation Proclamation. We couldn't let Haiti succeed in 1803 because we were a slaveocracy, as were most of the other powerful countries in the world. Um, and since then, the U.S. has continued to find ways to, uh, to undermine Haitian sovereignty and, and the development of a prosperous, independent Haiti. You know, people don't know this, but the largest in the, in the uh, 19th and early 20th centuries, we had a lot of U.S. Marine occupations. The longest one was actually in Haiti. We brought back slave labor. We overthrew presidents. We rewrote their constitution, but we didn't leave the country with more democratic structures than, than when we had arrived. And Haitians will tell you, they'll kind of go through that whole history, and they will say the common thread at each step is that the international community did not want Haiti to succeed as a, an independent, prosperous country because it was a bad example. In 1803, it was a bad example of, of uh, black people running their own country. I think the problem now in, in, in the uh, late 20th and early 21st century is that Haitian voters insist on voting for progressive candidates, people that will enlarge uh, the government sector in the economy through improved education, improved health care, things like that. And we have a bipartisan consensus 
that that less government is more and less government is better and that that the um, you know the, the Democrats have somewhat at least on, on domestic policy somewhat moved away from that but th that is still the case in foreign policy that we still distrust foreign governments that are trying to increase the role of the government in in society and we promote people who reduce that we're speaking with Brian Concanon who is uh, executive director of project blueprint uh, when we get to U.S. foreign policy, we're often presented with this false dichotomy of militarization or abandonment. You've got to keep bombing Afghanistan. You don't want to abandon those poor people. But is there, does there exist a third possibility or you know, hundreds of additional possibilities of ways to provide actual aid, if not reparations for harm done, uh, if there were the will to do it, uh, what would be... What, if anything, would be actually helpful other than getting the heck out? Yeah, I've been having a lot of conversations with Haitians about this, and they're, they, they say they don't even want to talk about it. They would admit that there's hundreds of possibilities of constructive help. Um, but they say, we don't even want to talk about that. You need to stop propping up our government. You need to stop being the problem before we can talk about the solution. And they're, you know, they... they People talk about, well, violence is going to break out, COVID is going to break out, hunger is going to break out. And Haitians are deeply terrified of that, but they know that it's going to break out with certainty if we continue on the same path of supporting a dictatorial government. So they don't even want to talk about the details. They say, stop, stop propping up the dictatorial government, let a Haitian solution emerge. And then you can have a government that can talk about, okay, how do we do aid? How do we do health care? How do we do these other things that we need? And, you know, the best example right now is, is COVID vaccines. Um, the uh, Biden administration last month uh, offered Haiti, um, I forgot the number, but a lot of COVID vaccines. And the Haitian government just doesn't have the capacity to, to distribute free vaccines. And that is because it's been a kleptocracy. Money's been diverted from from uh, government services to to supporting the, the president's political machine, and it literally does not have the capacity to to take free vaccines and get them into people's arms. And the the one of President Moise's last acts two weeks ago was a decree allowing the public sector, the private sector, to do vaccines, which was basically just admitting the government has absolutely no ability to do, to do anything, not to distribute vaccines, not to regulate them. And it said, okay, go ahead, clinics, get vaccines, which it's impossible. You can't just fly to Miami with an empty suitcase and fill it with vaccines. Um, but it was an admission that the government can't do the least thing to help its population get vaccinated a year and a half into a pandemic. What do, what do people in Haiti want to be able to do if the, the so-called international community were to stop interfering? Uh, would elections be organized? How long would that take? The first step is to have a transitional government that is no longer committing massacres, no longer um, stealing money um, at a rapid rate, and that has as its prime objective to organize fair elections. Uh, right now, there is no consensus on how long that would take. But what Haitians, if you ask that question of Haitians, they would say, give us the chance. Let us let us apply pressure to force the, the Moise government out. Um, and then we'll set something up and we'll figure out what works. But they just don't want uh, the international community to come in and impose deadlines um, and then, you know, the deadline becomes the issue. What, what, what the, the metric that, that the, and then that's the current situation with elections is the um, Biden administration wants to be able to say Haiti has elections on September 28th. They want to say they have, they finished the presidential elections in November. Um, and everybody wants elections, but having bad elections controlled by a dictatorship that are completed by November is not a solution to the problem. That's a, a prolongation of the problem. And Haitians will say, you know, just stop doing these bad things. Give us a chance to, to work this out. It, it, it seems like the, 
that the history is being repeated so many times without lessons being learned, and I wonder if there's any desire to learn them, both in the U.S. government and in the, the U.N. I mean, I see all these successes on small scales of, of unarmed civilian peacekeepers. I see there's this uh, movie called Soldiers Without Guns about an unarmed uh, peacekeeping effort by former UN peacekeepers who found it much more successful than their previous failures. Uh, where does the interest come from in always, whether it's a coup, an assassination, a hurricane, somebody sneezes, you send more troops and more arms uh, into Haiti. What, what drives that agenda? You know, I think it's similar to, to driving the policing agenda in the United States, where we have lots of things that are police doing, that police are doing in America that are clearly better done by, by uh, people who are unarmed and have specific training for those tasks. But the structures are set up that we always go for the, you know, the armed solution. And I think part of that is just psychologically within humans, we, we sort of think, okay, when when there's problems, there's we resort to force. But I also think it's 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 economic structures. And you have a lot of very powerful co companies that that make money off of these kinds of responses. You have um, the structures, you know, at the UN within the U.S. government. People are just the people that are in those positions are people who are trained to look at problems that way. I mean, they say that if you've got a hammer in your hand, every problem looks like a nail, and I think that. That is the case. And specifically, you know, within U.S. foreign policy, one of the reasons why we started Project Blueprint was that, you, you know, you have a relatively small group of sort of the official foreign policy community in, in Washington. And, um, and it, you know, it's, it's non-diverse in, in terms of race, in terms of age, in terms of gender, but also in terms of training. And, and so you don't have... You, you, people tend to kind of recycle the ideas that are already within that community and are are reluctant to allow new ideas to come in, especially new ideas that that question the foundations of people's careers and, and, and the profits of companies. You work on bringing the perspectives of people impacted by U.S. actions abroad into policy discussions. Have you have you had some success at that? Um, you know, not sure we've had any success in the sense that, that we've changed policies yet. I mean, I think that it's certainly within the immigration front that we've been working with, with other groups on that. I think that you have, by, by a lot of activists um, who are uh, immigrants in the United States, I think they have made the immigration advocacy much more effective. And, you know, certainly there's lots of room for improvement, but I think that that's one area where the Biden administration is is making some some improvements. And I think in a large part, it's because you have the people that are actually affected by that are, are the ones who are speaking and, and speaking very well. Uh, I don't think in terms of foreign policy that we've we've had much of an effect uh, in terms of actual policies. But one, you know, one really promising development is that the, uh, the members of the House Foreign Affairs Committee have been, uh, almost since the beginning of the Congress in January, have been, uh, have understood what needs to be done in Haiti and have been advocating for it. And that's actually pretty unusual. I mean, I've been working on Haiti for, for 26 years and had lots of, uh, seen lots of changes in administrations during that time. And the one, one of the constants is that, that, Members of Congress don't criticize foreign policy if, if it's their pres if a president from their party is in power. And it's extraordinary that the House Foreign Affairs Committee, under the leadership of Chairman Meeks, um, they are saying the right things, and they're they're sending letters explaining to, to President Biden why U.S. supporting this dictatorship is so problematic. They're having hearings where they're bringing in people from Haiti. Um, they are really doing the right thing. It has not led to a an improvement in policy yet, but I'm actually very hope, hopeful that, that that will eventually. We all need to kind of keep, keep pushing on that front. I, I think it's actually extremely rare for congressional hearings to include people from the part of the world impacted by what they're discussing. Uh, have you been involved in that, and how have those hearings gone that have included voices uh, of people actually from Haiti? 
Yeah, but so there was one hearing uh, in March, and it went great. I mean, it was it was it was shocking, and you know, I, I I'm a little bit conflicted on this, being you know, being a a middle aged white guy, um, and I'm grateful that you're talking to me. But you know, it it, it one of the things that my life's work has been to try to get people to listen to people who don't look like me, you know, to get people from Haiti, and and that has been. Um, you know, we've been working on this for a long time. Lots of people have been doing it. And um, this is, I think this is the first time I can think of that, that an entire hearing was done by what was by either, it was one Haitian American and then two Haitians. Um, and it was really effective. It was, those people spoke with voices that were instantly credible and authentic. The members of Congress understood that. Um, and it, and they were, they were, they, did it very politely, but they were really pushing back against kind of the framing of the questions in ways that I hadn't seen done before in Congress. And they were able to really insist on saying, you know, when you got to these choices, okay, do we do military intervention or do we do we totally abandon? Um, you know, they would kind of kept bringing the, the subject back to Haitian pe- the Haitian people's voices and what the Haitian people want in a way that that uh, sort of the usual experts either hadn't or couldn't do as as well. So again, you know, I think that the fact we are starting to listen, at least in Congress and certainly in civil society, we are starting to listen to the voices of those people impacted. Um, there's also off, off, obviously lots of room for improvement, but I think that is a potential for having a better U.S. foreign policy. I think it's highly unusual and all to the good. And and I think sending letters that say the right stuff to the throne at the White House is all to the good. But what further actions have there been or could there be from Congress? Are there any members committed publicly to voting the right way for or against anything? Is there is there anything that people across the United States should be telling Congress members or the White House that they want done? Um, yeah, so right now there aren't any votes, but 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 the there is a Haiti caucus that 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 developed in Congress um, just about two months ago. I think it was launched in, in late May, um, and that and that is of all of progressive people, and it's designed to do exactly what you suggested to have to get um, be a focal point for getting good legislation. Um, that's focused on Haiti, that is principled and progressive. Uh, they don't have legislation right now. And I think what most people are doing now is is waiting on messages from the Haitian grassroots. I mean, with a, I'm work, working with a group of organizations in both Haiti and the U.S. that we're hoping to come up with a statement later this week that we will have, um, you know, that people can sign on to. That's a start. Uh, and then we're going to kind of keep building on that and, and get the concrete demands from Haitian civil society um, and get it into get it to Washington where too many decisions about Haitians rights are made. Uh, so there, there, people should keep an eye out for different um, opportunities. You can look at the, our website, which is Project Blueprint, or on Twitter, and, and we have a website. We'll have, once some of those uh, those advocacy opportunities come up, we'll have them. Uh, the organization that, that, I, that I'm on the board of, I'm no longer an employee, though, Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti, IJDH.org, they'll have a lot up there. Um, and, you know, so the main thing is, as with almost any other difficult issue, there's very little that, that um, an individual can do by themselves, but there, are, there will be opportunities emerging to, to join on to existing work. And I'll actually I'll add another, another uh, plug. Code Pink last week put out a, uh, a petition directly addressing this issue of military intervention, and I encourage people to sign that as well. No U.S. troops in Haiti, right? And and Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, among others, has been talking at least about no U.S. troops to Haiti. Isn't this something that Congress members, if they wanted, could make a commitment uh, to vote against uh, any bill that doesn't prohibit the use of funds for for troops to to Haiti? Uh, I mean, couldn't they couldn't they do that if they were really really serious? Um, you know, that's the broader issue of congressional oversight over over war making, which has, as you know, has eroded across the board. Uh, yeah, certainly I'd love to see Congress um, retake up its prerogative to, to do that. And I think there will be opportunities. Um, you know, there'll be opportunities on the budget, and there's opportunities to bring members of 
of the administration in to ask them hard questions, which is another thing that happened just after the, um, the, the, the hearing we talked about before where you had the Haitian groups come in, Haitian representatives come in to testify before Congress. Then they brought in the, um, the administration and that was a closed session. They apparently asked very tough questions and did not get good answers. Um, and so I think that is another another thing that Congress can do is to continue to to push back against the uh, against the administration, ask them to explain this policy. And the, another place where people where Congress I think can make a difference is on oh this is a little bit controversial or it is controversial is the issue of of um, sanctions. So, for example, there's the Leahy Law that prohibits sending uh, U.S. support for security forces that are involved in uh, human rights violations. And, you know, the Harvard Law School report showed that the, that the police are involved in crimes against humanity. Uh, that should clearly raise a red flag and should get Congress to, to push back against funding for the police under the Leahy Law. They should be bringing in the administration, asking them hard questions. How are they justifying it? How are they, sh how are they um, showing, how are they making sure that no money is going to units that are, that are doing the killing? Yeah, I just, I can't imagine why if you had 10 members in the House who really meant it, you couldn't stop that. Uh, because, it, I mean, especially if the Republicans all vote no be on, on a military bill because the generals said something against racism or whatever, cockamamie reason, you only need five Democrats to vote no, and that's, and they've got actual power to influence what's in the thing. Um, but I haven't heard a single one, much less five. So I'm not, I'm not holding my breath. Uh, Brian Concannon, we just got a, a minute and a half left. What what else can people do to to help out, uh, to fund, to influence, to keep in touch uh, with what you're working on? Yeah, what I always say, and I think this works across a broad spectrum of issues, is two things. Stay informed and stay engaged. Uh, there are lots of good sources. Uh, you know, my Twitter feed, I try to put out the the, the, the all the, a lot of good sources on what's going on in Haiti. I'm at, uh, at Haiti Justice, but IJDH has some. The Center for Economic and Policy Research has a lot of great stuff on their website. And they were getting some good stuff into, into, into the New York Times and the Washington Post, mainstream media. Um, you know, read the good sources. And, and I'd use as a, as, a, as a starter, if they're calling for troops to go, stop reading and find something else to read. But stay engaged with organizations that are doing some of this advocacy. Uh, very good advice, uh, and let's push back against anyone advocating for more U.S. troops anywhere. Uh, Brian Concanyon is executive director of Project Blueprint. Uh, keep in touch with him. We'll have his links up at talkworldradio.org. Brian, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Okay, well, thanks so much for having me, David. I've really enjoyed this, this discussion. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.